In April 2015, I started this show to talk about fictional characters, with one character remaining at the very top of my to-do list. Long-time viewers might remember her being featured in the show's old animated intro. You remember that? God damn, that was a long time ago. A few months after Who Dat began, the Final Fantasy VII Remake was announced, a game which this character was set to appear in. I decided to hold off on making this episode until that game came out. I just didn't think I was going to be waiting five years after the fact. It's been a mad journey though, hasn't it? A long one, many ups and downs, as is the case with all things. I'd like to thank people like Kat Katoshi and Silent Tandem for supporting me along the way. Your help has been hugely appreciated and I honestly can't thank you enough. And uh, in general, sorry I kept you lot waiting, but um, yeah, yeah, it's finally time. I'm ready now. I'm going to talk about one of the most important video game characters in my life. Tifa Lockhart bounced her big bad gal breasts into my life when I was 14 years old, and despite me starting this episode with such crude humour, I mostly do it out of expectation. See, that's always been the common theme regarding Tifa, hasn't it? Her chest and how big it is. People unfamiliar with Final Fantasy VII look at this discourse thinking that there's nothing else to her than this. What's all the fuss about? Why do people rate her so high? She's just a walking pair of tits and so on and so forth. Well, that's the whole point of this video, to educate you on Tifa's qualities beyond that aspect, while simultaneously documenting what makes this character so important to me personally. So, starting over, I was 14 years old when I was first introduced to Tifa Lockhart. Yo, look at this one right here. Teenage Digivalentine, rocking a middle-parted undercut hairstyle, holding a Nokia 3210 mobile telephone device, with black and white low-resolution printouts of Tifa fan art plastered all over my bedroom wall. Real life. Real love. I told you before. I told you time before, bruv. I've been down. I've been down. I've been down. You lot want to appear out the woodwork now? I've been down since day, fam. It's real life. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, I became a Tifa Lockhart fanboy pretty quickly. Fan service, sure, but there was more to her than what the average eye candy pinup girl was doing for your boy back then. Tifa had depth, structure, and tons of familiarity about her that I couldn't shake off easily. Simply put, I found a character I completely understood. There were layers beyond the physical attraction that not only surprised me, but left a strong lasting impression. And we're gonna get into all that real soon, but first, a little bit of backstory. Eh, you should probably expect spoilers. Presuming you've already watched the episode on Aerith, I won't repeat myself on what the basic storyline is for Final Fantasy VII. If you need a refresher, then it might be best to watch her who that video first. Other than that, we'll dive right into Tifa's backstory. Tifa Lockhart and our lead protagonist, Cloud Strife, go way back before the events of the game. Growing up together in the same remote village of Nibelheim, Cloud tells Tifa that he will be leaving to pursue his dreams of joining the military task force, Soldier. Tifa asks Cloud to make a promise that should he achieve his dreams, if she were ever in need of assistance, then he would come to her aid. Cloud agrees to the promise, and they part ways. Fast track to the present day, Tifa is now living in the big sprawling metropolis known as Midgar. In the slums, she works at a bar called Seventh Heaven, a popular spot for the locals. The bar hides a secret, however, as it's also the hidden base of the rebel group Avalanche, to which Tifa is a member of. Avalanche are in need of some help for their next mission, that of which involves blowing up a Mako reactor belonging to Shinra, a corporation that is draining the planet of its non-renewable energy resources. It just so happens that Cloud is now in town, and is a mercenary for hire after having achieved and moved on from his dream of joining Soldier. With Avalanche needing help for their mission, Tifa and Cloud's childhood promise still on the table, and Cloud himself currently available for work, all the pieces seem to fit neatly into place. Tifa asks Cloud to join their cause, to which Cloud agrees, if the price is right. Avalanche's leader Barrett doesn't take much of a liking to Cloud, and the feeling is more than mutual, but regardless, they team up and go off to blow up some macro reactors. And that's all you need to know for the basic story setup. 
Yes, I'm purposefully leaving out later plot twists and major story development because even though this game is over 20 years old, I still think there are some things that shouldn't be spoiled for you. Any details I need to cover later on in the video, I'll just skirt around carefully without diving too deep into. Speaking of skirts... Visual design. That's a short skirt, bruv. Like, get me, I've seen wet wipes from KFC that were longer than Tifa's skirt. Jesus. When it comes to Tifa, the main element that everybody notices first about her appearance is how fan service it is. Long uncovered legs, very short skirt, midriff tank top exposing her belly, the chest area, which oddly doesn't display a cleavage now that I think about it, how quaint. No, on first glances, if you're looking at Tifa and seeing fan service, then you'd be right. It's clearly on display. Now, remember all of this for later, okay? We'll be coming back to this subject for a point I want to make. In the meantime, let's break it down and see what's going on here. There's two things you need to know about Miss Lockhart. Firstly, she's a bartender. She works at 7th Heaven, serving food and drink to customers. Secondly, she's a martial artist. Trained during her youth by a legendary warrior named Zangan, Tifa has mastered a wide array of fighting moves. What I like about Tifa's appearance is how these two factors are incorporated into her design. Let's start with the bartender aspect. She's wearing long black sleeves matched together with a short black miniskirt that is being held up by suspenders. Her hair is styled to one side, allowing a teardrop earring to display clearly without obstruction. Straight away, these elements give off a hostess vibe. The sleeves and earring offer a sense of class to the appearance, while the skirt and suspenders cater to the more sultry and sexy side of the outfit. The overall image is to attract attention, and so a large amount of skin is being shown. With her hair being long and dark, coupling together with warm reddish-brown eyes and a gentle smile, Tifa's alert feels enigmatically inviting. It's precisely the aura that you'd want to emit to attract people towards you. Then we have her martial artist aspect. Deep red gloves are worn on her hands, being paired together with heavy-duty boots of the same colour. The padding clearly shows us that these items are designed to hit things while protecting the user, so she's a combatant. Her long hair is tied at the end with a similar deep red hairband, keeping the strands collected and out of her way. The left boot and elbow have studded armour plating, offering further aid during battle. And lastly, she wears a plain white tank top that keeps most of her upper body unrestrained, allowing her to move freely. These elements all clearly indicate that this character would kick your ass if required. Bringing these two stars together, you suddenly have a very unique look for one of your leading female protagonists. A beat em up bartender. A brawling bar hostess. She mixes drinks and saves lives. And yes, that was a Valhalla reference. Big ups if you caught it. Tifa's design has a calm balance between attraction and profession. It's attractive without slutty. It's combat orientated without covering her in traditional martial arts garb, and both sides are in harmony across her appearance. Fan service aspects are going to draw you in initially, but tracing along those areas, like her legs or her torso, brings you closer to her hands and feet, which are housed by large blocky gloves and boots, telling you she's more than just her looks. By observing Tifa, you're invited into her design on one aspect, then you're educated further on what the character is beyond that. It's brilliant design that utilises every part of her to get information across to you. My favourite part of her design is... And, and this is going to sound really, really strange at first, so just wait a second and hear me out, but... It's her socks. Weird, isn't it? But listen, right? After spending all this time talking about how beautifully blended her appearance is, why would the pair of normal-looking socks be the highlight? Well, that's precisely it. They're normal. And a whole design that is so focused on conveying elements of both bar hostess and combatant, it's these simple pair of black stripy socks that anchor everything. They're subtle. You wouldn't notice it at first, but they're the one item that caters to neither aspect. They're neutral. They're neither alluring, nor are they worn to perform certain tasks in. In my opinion, they humanise Tifa from the two main extremes of her overall design. Everything else about her is pinpoint precise on what it needs to tell you, and then there's this pair of socks that are just... ordinary. Like she just put them on in a hurry because she was late for work or something, you know? It gives her a badass appearance, a nice little homegirl next door vibe, and I love that. 
Her design for the remake is a nice variation and it definitely fits in with the more realistic aesthetic that the remake is going for. Tifa looks good. I especially love the fact that they toned her abs now, showing us that physically Tifa is a strong girl and someone who keeps her body in shape. It goes hand in hand with her being a martial artist, you know, you need to train the body continuously so I'm glad they've displayed it as such. The thigh highs are different. They complement her long black sleeves so there is a natural visual chemistry between her arms and legs now. This works in execution and design wise, it makes sense. But as a personal preference? I mean I literally just told you why I thought her original socks brought subtle balance to her overall image and without them now it feels like her design loses that neutral humanizing aspect. But that's just me. And seriously, I've just spent the last few minutes telling you why I feel Tifa's original design is pretty much perfect. So anything they were going to do with her for the remake was going to catch me a little differently. You know, perfection in the eyes of the beholder and all that. It's still a good design though. Don't take this and quote me like I'm hating on it or something because I'm definitely not. Tifa looks great in the remake. But you know, I've got mad love for the old school. And that's the long and short of it. Either way, whichever design you personally prefer, the portrayal of Tifa is more or less the same. They both carry similar energies between them. Tifa is a fighter, Tifa is a bartender, and Tifa appears strong and confident. And that's an interesting aspect to focus on now, isn't it? Tifa's confidence. Because for everything her visual design does to paint a picture of her, Tifa's personality reminds us that looks aren't always entirely what they seem. Personality. Earlier on I told you to remember all the fan servicey elements from Tifa's visual design. The reason is because fan service tends to be a very direct and shallow experience. Fan service is eye candy, and while it's nice for some brainless entertainment, that's exactly what it is. Brainless and lacking substance. I can't speak for every single character out there that's showing off large breasts and a miniskirt, but more often than not, you tend to get nothing much else beyond that. What I truly love about Tifa is how she breaks those tropes and diverts your expectations. And depending on the context you're viewing the character in, she doesn't even do this alone either. When Square was designing Tifa, they took Aerith into consideration. They wanted the player to have variety when interacting between the two leading female characters, and a wonderful dynamic was created as a result. Aerith was visually designed to look like the quiet, innocent girl, but upon spending time with her, you realise she's very outgoing, very outspoken, and tough around the edges. She means what she says, and she doesn't ever shy away from anything. Tifa was then created to have a visual design that looked boisterous, revealing and loud, but upon spending time with her you realise that actually, Tifa seems a little reserved in comparison. She can be emotionally timid and depending on the subject, quite shy to talk to. Where Aerith has no trouble displaying her emotions clearly, Tifa sometimes finds it difficult to say what she really feels. Between the pair of them your expectations get spun, it's a fantastic mix up. Aerith is not fan servicey at all, but acts like the character who is. And Tifa is the character with all the fan service attributes, but acts like she isn't. I love this so much. Not just because it's a dynamic that puts a different take on a tired trope, but for what this design decision did in moulding Tifa into the character she is. Let's talk about that in more detail now and focus on Tifa's merits alone. As I've established already, Tifa has trouble with portraying certain emotions. This doesn't mean she's completely emotionally inept, you know, she's not a brick wall. When she is happy, she shows it. When she is sad, she shows it. She can cheer on her friends and she can sympathise with those who are hurting. If anything, Tifa is there for people more than she is there for herself because when the topic suddenly becomes about herself, she's not really sure what to do with it. And that's when the key to her heart suddenly tightens. It's right there in her name. Lockheart. A heart that is locked down. Tifa harbours so many feelings, but due to her nature, she keeps a portion of these feelings locked away. One subject in particular is Cloud, our lead protagonist and the homeboy she grew up with. Tifa feels certain things for Cloud but can't bring herself to tell him outright. She values his company a lot and is often seen being attentive when in his presence, but should their interactions begin to touch upon some of those feelings, Tifa will reserve her thoughts again. Some storyline elements come into play later on that puts Tifa in a very difficult situation requiring her to speak up about something important, but because it involves Cloud, she can't do it. No matter how hard she tried, that tiny voice inside her wouldn't let her. To a certain degree, looking at today's mental health awareness and seeing how far we've come with it since this game released, I would say that Tifa does suffer from some forms of anxiety. 
an internal voice that shuts us down to such an extent that we are rendered emotionally distraught and conflicted. This might feel familiar to some of us. Anxiety affects us, it stops us from making positive decisions and we collapse in on ourselves because it's easier to keep quiet and accept what currently is rather than speaking out and trying to change what holds us back. It's important to note that although Tifa has this underlying issue, it doesn't halt her from performing other tasks or continuing to live her life. She works at the bar, she trains and hones her body, she fights for the planet and aims to protect her friends with the skills she has. Tifa is strong-minded in all these regards. In fact, when it comes to matters like this, Tifa never doubts herself at all. She is confident in her abilities as a warrior, she holds her own and stands tall, and Tifa has complete belief in her skills because they are second nature to her. They need not be questioned. But when it comes to matters of the heart, there will always be part of it locked away, out of fear that her feelings will cause pain to herself and those around her. Taking all this into account, from her dynamic between Aerith and Cloud, to her fierce strengths and crippling weaknesses, we start to see Tifa as something very real and very familiar. And on that note... Importance. Things are going to get real for me now. That's the purpose of this section after all, isn't it? To document the importance of the character, whether it be to their in-game world or our real world. Well, in this episode, I'll be using this section to explain why Tifa is important to me personally. Because for all the characters out there to come and go, for every single character that gave me some good vibes or personal things to think about, Tifa forever remained in my heart long after the game was over. She became the pinnacle of familiarity. My attention was initially drawn towards her because of the fan service. A pair of breasts standing out amongst the lineup during a victory pose. Of course I was going to notice her for that reason. I was 14 years old at the time, what else was I going to be looking at? Me and my cousins went through Final Fantasy VII together, with me reading the in-game text out loud to our group. I suppose from reading her words openly and uttering her lines as if they were my own, I felt the connection to what she would say. Things she said were things I would have said. Sometimes before her text window even appeared, I had feelings about certain story situations in my mind, and then as if on cue, Tifa would say precisely what I was thinking in a way I would have said it in. I was really beginning to recognise this character. And another thing, Tifa dresses to impress, she appears outgoing, but there's a voice inside her that sometimes stops her from progressing, and she goes quiet. I did that. I like to flex a little with the stuff I would wear, I wanted to look as good as I could, but if it came down to having to talk about certain things, I was very shy and reserved. I wasn't as loud as the other kids, and honestly, unless I was completely comfortable, I wasn't that loud at all. And then comes the love triangles, oof, yeah, alright, let's see a show of hands, who here has been in a love triangle? I'm just going to presume you've all put your hands up. Either that or throw your hands up in the comments section, whatever works. Tifa found herself in a love triangle between Aerith and Cloud, not necessarily out of competitive reasons, but it's hard not to feel a little reserved when you like somebody and other people are involved, and everything just becomes so bloody complicated. Even when a triangle isn't the case, just trying to discuss this subject with the person in question is nerve-wracking. Seeing Tifa go through the reservations about opening up to Cloud was a feeling I had felt plenty of and would feel plenty more of in the years to come. I personally wear my emotions on my sleeve a lot, it's why I put so much of myself through the content I produce, but there's a part of me that just needs to keep certain things locked down, if only for as long as I can keep them locked down. Maybe I don't understand it yet. Maybe I worry it will do more harm than good if I spoke out about it. Whatever the reason, I lock it away, safe in the knowledge that it can't ruin anything if it isn't anything. But it takes its toll on you, doesn't it? The longer you keep it locked away, the more it worries you because you're not actively resolving it. It's just sitting there in your heart, chipping away at your mental state. To harbour locked feelings, to lock down your heart when all you really want to do is open it up, these things are so very familiar to me. And here was Tifa going through it. Every text window, every story moment, I found myself resonating with this character. She was unlike anything else. Through understanding her, she became one of the most important fictional characters in my life. And even after all the cameos, after all the different spin-offs that this character has been through, you'd think that maybe this connection might have worn off. That maybe something would have changed. Maybe I would have moved on and found another character to occupy that chair. 
Nope, not in the slightest. Tifa still got it, and she still got me. Oh, oh my god, what a fucking lame bro. I wrote it and I told myself, do you know what, don't read that, it's corny. I still read it out. What an idiot, fuck it, let's wrap this up, man. Jesus Christ. Conclusion. For various reasons, and for a better use of these next few words, Tifa became a waifu and or idol for a lot of people. She just ticked a lot of boxes. She was a strong, powerful fighter that could carry her own, she looked incredibly attractive, and underneath all of that was the markings of a truly relatable character depending on how deep you wanted to get with her. Tifa entered my life when I was in my early teens, the most developing period. Numerous things can leave their mark on you during your childhood. Tifa was one of those marks for me. She just did so much in such a small amount of time, it was hard not to be blown away by her. To the wide world, have there been other characters before or after Tifa to have done what she did? No doubt. You're probably watching this thinking of another character that affected you in the same way Tifa got to me. And if so, big ups to you and yours, it's all love. But when it comes down to my personal factors, Tifa punched me right in the heart and stayed there. All the depth to her personality and her dynamic within the group, all her strengths and weaknesses, the way she presented herself and dealt with her issues, all the time spent watching this character interact and recognising her vibe at its very core. Without question, Tifa's getting the Valhar emblem. I didn't expect to find so much familiarity in her, but I did. I found one of the most recognisable fictional characters I've ever had the opportunity to experience. It's just crazy to think that all this started because I saw a pair of tits in it. What's going on everybody, how are you? I hope you enjoyed this episode. I personally feel happy and content to have finally, finally covered her on this show now. It was a long time coming after all. Let me know your thoughts on Tifa in the comments, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about her too. And that if you're new around these ends, please consider subscribing as well. Big shout outs to these wicked people for funding this episode through Patreon. Much love to you lot, and thank you for your continued support, it's hugely appreciated. And uh, I guess if you need to find me outside the YouTube, then I sometimes make random appearances on Twitter and Instagram. So head there if you're into those sorts of things too. I've been Digi Valentine. Thanks for your time. Take care. And I'll see you all again real soon.